Hi, this is Jeff Schultz of Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. We're here at the Willamette Model Railroad Club in Clackamas, Oregon, with David Biederman, the president of the club, and Rick Andrews, who has the honor of being the remaining charter member of the club. So, Rick, give us a little bit of the history of the club and how you ended up in your present location. Well, we were formed in late 1984, and we got a clubhouse, which was an old garage, off of Holly Street on 99 near the Bomber. We designed a layout and we're getting ready to build it until we realized that the lease was month by month and there was a possibility that the building was going to be sold. So we decided let's find another place. One of the members was a captain for the fire department which shared the parking lot with this uh, community center and he said, I've got a spot. Uh, it's 27 by 30. The only uh, catch was is it need to be excavated out so we could actually have a layout. So we did that. And it took us, I think, three months to excavate it out. And we put the layout in the 27 by 30 foot space. There was another basement beyond this that was also 30 by 30, I believe. Um, but that was going to be a harder excavation project. So we had this layout in this current basement until 19 or until 2003 when there was a flood upstairs in the kitchen and it flooded 90% of the ceiling and we realized that we were going to have to eliminate the layout in order to fix the ceiling so it was decided at that time okay since we're going to do that let's go ahead and go into the other basement and do that excavation project and five years later we actually got it done and this is where we're at right now we started benchwork construction in early 2009 on the current layout so when you say excavation how much material are we talking about here well, I don't remember exactly. I've got the stats, but I don't remember the exact numbers. But all I can tell you is that we took out approximately 32 full dump truck loads of dirt in five, about five years. That's what we did. Okay, and since Oregon has a tendency to grow rocks, any of significant size? Yes. We had quite a few that were rather huge. Luckily, we were able to expedite the project when one of the members had a friend who had a pneumatic jackhammer, which was, if we here were not going to use that, we would, have, we would have just stayed in this room and had a different layout. But the pneumatic jackhammer helped quite a bit, and we took out some major rocks. In fact, we have four of them out on the courtyard. Those are the significant rocks. The, first, the last rock that was taken out of the back basement, the last rock that was taken out of the front basement, and there was some other rock, and I can't remember what that was. I think it was the... I can't remember now, but uh, we had some, some huge rocks that were in here uh, that we had to pull. So, okay, David, how about how much complete is the layout? Oh, well, currently the layout is about three quarters complete. We have about 500 feet of main line that we expect to have when we finish it. Currently it's about 350 to 370 operating. Um, as you can see perhaps uh, in the video, we're currently finishing the last quarter of the four quarters of the room. And when it's done, 550 feet, and that's just main line only? That is just main line only. We have uh, two major yards. We have a major helix uh, for moving out of the staging yards. Uh, and then, of course, there are many spurs and uh, short, short rails everywhere. So what sort of staging is this going to be? Where the railroad runs from Albany, Oregon to Bend, Oregon and beyond, and we stage from those two towns. Uh, so in terms of staging, we have approximately between five and ten trains staged at any given time, running both directions. Uh, t we have built this and designed it in such a way we could run in a circular pattern if need be, but it's not intended to. It's a point-to-point -point railroad. So are trains being made up on the fly during the session, or is it all staged prior to the session, or a combination thereof? When we begin a session, we'll have three to four trains ready to go, but we run a dispatch uh, here, so dispatch is in control of the railroad and how many trains are coming out at any given time. Uh, from that point forward, uh, in a full session, there are approximately 40 trains that will go out. So we stage the first four or five, but then the rest of those are being made as we're actually operating. Okay, and Rick, why did the club pick this particular locale, prototype, well, freelance prototype to model? Uh, process of elimination. Um, 
we decided when we were doing the excavating, the core group, we were going to make sure that we weren't going to make the same mistakes that we did on the first layout. One of the big ones was the concept of the layout. The original layout was just mythical. It had towns, but there was no rhyme or reason. The scenery was vaguely in western Oregon, but if you'd ask somebody where in western Oregon it would be, the answer would be, well, in the western part of western Oregon. It wasn't anything that was, it wasn't anything that was specific. So the idea was to have some kind of a locale that either was something like the Columbia Gorge, which was already taken. Uh, we thought about the Siskiyou line, that was too far south. Willamette Pass was, would be neat, but it wasn't operationally oriented, which is also what we wanted. That was a big prerequisite. So finally, one day, I was perusing through the internet, and I came upon the Bear Creek in South Jackson. And I looked on his website, and I saw he had a map of Oregon, and he had a line cutting straight across from Toledo all the way to Ontario. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, what if? And then I, at that time, I didn't even know. I knew the, the SP Mill City branch was just a branch, and I didn't know it actually had, they had surveyed it over San Am Pass. And they were actually, the actual idea was to connect with Ontario. So finally, I saw that, and I thought, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. So I looked in Tom Dill's book and Ed Austin's book, SP in Oregon, and I actually read about the history, and I thought, well, what if we change history a little bit? What if, what if the line actually made it? And our railroad actually had the line over the Sis or the uh, uh, Sandy Am Pass, Siskiyou line. No, <laughs> anyway. Um, so that's how it started. That's that was the seed that was planted in my brain about doing a design like that. We ended up having a design off of four different layout concepts. One was the SP Valley line. One was um, the Siskiyou line. And there were two Sandy Am Pass lines. One was a double-decked Sandy Am Pass line, which actually ran from Toledo all, or Yaquina all the way to Ontario. Wow. Yeah. And then my line, which was my idea, which was dubbed Sandy Am Pass Light, because it wasn't <laughs> double-decked, it was only single-decked. And, and my concept won, and then we went ahead and started building. And as far as, did you mention something about the scale? No, but why not? Well, we, we always wanted to do HO, so we just stayed with HO. That's every, that was the most popular scale with all the members, so we weren't going to change it. So how did the name Columbia, Cowlitz, and Western come about? Cascade and Western. Cascade and Western. Uh, I think, if I remember right, way back when we first started, we kind of had Name the Railroad Contest, and we had a bunch of names, and, and that one was the most popular. That's, that's pretty much what I can remember. So it just basically happened and everybody liked it. Yeah, exactly. Everybody liked it. Okay. Rick, um, how'd you pick which era? I mean, it looks like you're in the mid to late 70s here. 1979, and the membership picked the era. We had uh, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and so we just kind of voted on it, and it came down to the 50s and the 70s, and the 70s won out. And originally it was going to be 1975, but then... We thought, how about making it at the end of the decade because that would add uh, center beams and also um, uh, the covered uh, auto racks as well. Mm -hmm. So we ended up in, I think it's September, September, September 79, 79. Is, is the era, specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, local railroads, you had in that kind of general time zone, the Burlington Northern, the Southern Pacific, the Union Pacific, um, even the Milwaukee Road, if you go a little further north, right. go a little back, further back in history, you've got the SPNS in this area. Mm -hmm. Were any of those railroads a particular influence or a combination of them? Oh, not really. Um, we connect with the SP in Albany, which is staging, and the Burlington Northern in Albany, which is staging, and we connect with the BN also, the BN Oregon Trunk in Bend, which is also staging. And we also kind of change history a little bit and say that Milwaukee Road actually came down and crossed into Oregon and came into Bend. So we have a connection with Milwaukee Road, too. As I've noticed, Dane, you run a pretty eclectic set of motive power here. Then if you think from big Alcos to uh, little EMDs. Yeah, it's kind of the railroad kind of picked up orphans from other railroads, basically, I believe, is what the, the concept is. So, But we do have some would be some current power for the for that time which is running our hot shot trains and they're the ones if I don't even think on the video that was shown but 
the the current power has a different little different paint scheme it's red black and white mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas the older older units have the blue and gray and white scheme on them so you've got your own transition going on mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and we're kind of sort of like the SPNS it's you never know what color is what <laughs> <laughs> okay um, David construction um, You've got it kind of doing in multiple phases here. How did that come about? And is, is there a time plan? And how well are you meeting that if there is? Well, the construction started in this area that you can see behind us here. This is Tallman. Uh, as equally, we were starting with the staging because obviously that's how the railroad runs. And then we simply followed on around uh, the corner through Irwinville and on into Lebanon and uh, on. As each crew got farther and farther along, another crew would start up behind them. So everything is in stages. We're not actually trying to do all of it once. Well, we're actually doing pieces. So after the track work was in here, then along came the ballasting, along came the turnouts, which uh, are a whole separate crew, and we continued on through. Then scenery. Um, and th the goal initially was to get operation up as quickly as possible. So I would say that from the time we started this, which was approximately three years ago, uh, we were up and operating in six months, had it all the way through to the end of Albany or uh, Lebanon. Uh, and then we just con continued to proceed. At that time, we fairly well formed that there were really four phases to what we were doing. Uh, this being the first phase, taking us to Lebanon. The second phase, uh, continuing on around into Lyons and, and terminating there at Shelburne. Uh, then the major phase then started from that, uh, which was to take it continuing on past Shelburne into Lyons, around the corner East Lyons, up through Fox Valley, around the corner into Mill City, coming around to Gates. Uh, so Mill City basically was, was a lot of the second phase. And then uh, we continued, and behind us here we have the staging area that is the other end of the railroad at this point. Now we have started to finish this last quarter of the space, which is phase three. We anticipate we'll have this running probably in about six to eight months. Uh, our goal is to have the entire railroad operating in time for the 2015 NMRA convention that'll be here in Portland. Um, it's all run very, very well. We've been able to actually exceed our expectations, um, partly because that's we have a very reasonable general manager as far as the construction and gives us deadlines that we can meet. Uh, and we've got a really good group of people working here. Uh, there are approximately seven or eight crews. The members get to choose which crew they want to be on. Each crew has a foreman. The foreman is responsible for the overall uh, progress and success of that particular group. And all of the groups have done really, really well. Uh, as you can imagine, we've had some turnover in three years. But new people have stepped up uh, to take over the crews and to join new crews. And it has just gone swimmingly, frankly. All right, guys. You've got what I would call floating staging. In fact, I see you've got it named USS Granite Mountain now, and there's a USS Lions on it previously. Tell me how that came to be, what the reasoning behind it was, and how it's worked. Well, we when we got the layout started, the idea, uh, well, actually, we got into a dilemma. And that is we wanted to operate because we hadn't been operating for, what, five years. Right. And we were getting operating withdrawals. We were able to go to other layouts and operate them, but there were a lot of guys that were getting, the, you know, they were like that. And so we were trying to figure out we can't really, we don't want to build the whole layout at once because that's going to take a long time and we're not going to be able to operate. We had staging over here and we moved west geographically through Tallman where you see mm -hmm. here and moved that way. So the idea was, well, why don't we do it in phases? And why don't we have the other end be uh, mobile staging, if you will? So one of the members came up with the idea, well, why don't we build an aircraft carrier with like three tracks on it that was the length of our longest trains, and we could just move it as we progress the layout around. So that's what we did. The first phase, which is the USS Lyons, which is right in front of me right here, was over in Lyons as a three-track staging, so we ran trains from staging in Albany to staging in Lyons. And then we moved it angularly because we wanted to start phase two and we wanted to start with Lyons working east up the hill, so we made it at an angle so we could get Lyons started but still be able to operate trains. 
once we got phase two started, we pulled it out, brought it in here, and finished up the bench work. And then now it's at its present location and its last location, uh, the USS Granite Mountain now. Um, and once we get phase three in, we'll be taking it out altogether and it'll be scrapped. So we were able to satisfy our operating fix and still be able to do bench work. So what has been the biggest challenge of building this layout so far, and aside from 30-odd uh, truckloads of dirt? <laughs> I don't know what you know, would be the biggest challenge. I was going to say, I mean, this is smooth. So it's been really smooth. Smooth, yeah. And, and I, you know, We've we had, actually had some bonuses. Yeah. Um, we actually found out that when we were doing the valances, when we were mapping out the valances... Uh, we found out that the both rooms were a foot wider each way, which helped great with the design. Yeah. Thankfully, it was a foot wider and not a foot narrower. <laughs> the only other, uh, I guess you could call it a challenge, in the, in the back room there are nine posts, and we couldn't take them out because they're load-bearing. They're, you know, supporting three beams. Um, the, I think the biggest challenge is, is that we miss calculated where the coordinates of a couple of those posts were. And it turned out that we had track, instead of going behind the post, it goes in front of the post. And we have another one over here where we have a, a scenery offset between the backdrop and the track of six inches. Well, the post is three and a half inches back. So those have been the only yeah. two real setbacks. The other challenge was designing the layout is trying to get it to meander around the posts. And you're going to have your minimum or maximum mainline radius set by the distances the posts are, and we wound up having to have 30-inch maximum. We couldn't have anything more than that. Plus, the Iowa space is a challenge because of the posts, and we had a 30-inch minimum pinch point on Iowa. So we, we, uh, we have a lot of pinch points, and there's going to be more when we get phase three in there, but the decision was made, we, you know, we want to put a layout in here, so right. this is what we're going to do. So when we have operating sessions, we have a limited amount of, only, we try to keep it just having the crews in here and not have a lot of spectators because it, you know, it creates bottlenecks. Yeah, I guess if there was a challenge, is trying to keep people, when we're actually operating, is trying to keep the engineers and conductors who are off duty out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they want to come over, obviously, and follow it around, yes. and so that's probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. Challenge is we're having way too much fun here. Yeah. I know I've been guilty of that myself, <laughs> usually with a camera. Yeah. Um, okay. Tell me a little bit about the club. I mean, how many people you've got, how membership, how is it meant, um, handled, things like that. We have uh, a 30-member limit on the club, uh, which right now all slots are filled with either active members or probationary members. Uh, it's all word of mouth. Uh, I was talking with somebody the other day saying, you don't advertise or anything. I said, we don't have to. We, uh, we we are the only club in this region that I know of, other than private layouts, uh, but the only large club which actually operates a railroad. Other clubs are show railroads, and they're beautiful in their own right, but they don't operate like we do. We have a, a full-time dispatcher here when we're operating. Uh, we're running four to five road crews at, at any given time during operating session, you know, two local crews, two yards. So, and then, of course, people staging trains and doing ancillary support tasks. So there's a lot to do. We attract everyone. We actually are starting to have a waiting list of people who would like to join the club. Uh, membership is, generally speaking, of all ages. Uh, we have people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, a lot of retired people, as you can imagine. Uh, so we have a nice uh, cross-section of people. We have people who work for the railroad. Uh, we have people who don't have anything to do with the railroad but just like enjoy model railroading. So it's, it's a nice cross-section. Yeah. Okay. A lot of talents. Yeah. A lot of talented people in this, in this, in this club. Yeah, electricity, computers, uh, modeling, scenery, track. Uh, it seems like we just draw the right people at the right mm -hmm. time. And that's one of the reasons why there really haven't been any building challenges. The crews have just been right there to step in and go. Mm -hmm.